So, are you recording? Yep. Okay. Uh, today is May 5th, 2017. We are at the workplace of, in the home of Dan MacArthur on MacArthur Road in Marlboro. My name is Benjamin Connor, and today I will be interviewing you. All right. Uh, hey, excuse me. Are you going to be able to sit on that without yes. doing that? <laughs> okay. It's going to be important that you not do that. Okay. All right. Thank you. On video camera, we have Roxanne Burt. On audio recording, we have Ben Kowalski. And we have Sean Von Rant on still camera. Are you guys good? Yep. Good? Yep. Good? Mm -hmm. well, okay. I'm going to ask you a few questions about your background. Right. Uh, have you always lived in Marlboro? I have, yes. Do you live in the same house you grew up in or a different one? I live in a different house, but it's on the same piece of property, a house that we built. And my family still lives in the house that I grew up in. Right. Uh, how far from your childhood home is your current home? About a half a mile. Uh, when did you build the house that you live in now? 1975 through 1978. And were, were you the only one who built it or did you have help? We, my wife and I pretty much built it ourselves. But we had help from friends, yeah. too. Uh, what are some desi design features of your house that you feel are especially successful? Uh, well, we built our house kind of on the cheap. So one of the design features is it didn't cost us very much. We cut uh, all of the wood for it uh, from our own forests and had it milled up into uh, lumber and boards. So it didn't cost very much. It's worked out well. Uh, it could have better insulation. Yeah. Could have better windows, but it didn't cost very much, and we own it. How about that? That's really yeah. Alright, uh, aside from Marlboro, uh, have you ever lived anywhere else as an adult? No. Alright. Uh, what are some of the good points about having lived in the same town all your life? I think one of the, the best things about it is uh, just having some continuity, understanding of the ways that that town has changed over the last 50, 60 years. Uh, I can see the differences in the, the kinds of issues that people have living here now that they didn't have and, and vice versa. There were issues that people had before they don't have. So I guess I would say continuity is, uh, you know, or lack thereof is one of the big advantages for me of having been here for a long time. Are there any bad parts of living in the same place that you lived all your life? You know, I, I wouldn't know that because if I lived somewhere else, uh, I, I, I might have, things might have happened to me that, that, that didn't happen. So I can't really answer that. I don't see the downside of it. I like living here very much. All right. Uh, how, would you describe, I'm sorry, how would you describe yourself as a child? Uh, <laughs> uh, that I don't know either. Um, I think I was... Uh, I, I don't think I was always uh, the kindest person as a child. Um, I think I was a little precocious, but I, I, but I really don't know that for sure. Yeah. That's, those are guesses. Yeah. Uh, may I ask what your age is now? 67. How many siblings do you have and what are their names? So my parents had five children. My oldest brother, John, I'm the second. Uh, my next younger brother, Patrick, next younger brother, Gary, and my younger sister, Megan. And Patrick uh, died when he was in his mid-40s, about 20 years ago now. Oh, so there are four of us left. Uh, do they live here in Marlboro or Vermont, or do they go somewhere else? My older brother lives in New Mexico, and my brother, Gary, and my sister, Megan, both live right here on the same piece of property. Uh, what are some of the good points about having less of your siblings live close by? Yep, say that again, please. Sorry. What are some of the good points about having most of your siblings live close by? Oh, that's, uh, well, I'll give you a good example. Um, my dad, our dad, passed away this last January, and uh, on the 7th of May, we're actually having a memorial service for him, and people will come, you know, if they want to say something or not, it doesn't really matter. But the great part about having the family here is that everybody's part of it, yeah. you know? So uh, you might not do that if you were living on your own, but because there are three of us siblings here, and because it's such an important thing, passing of our dad, 
we are putting together a little uh, memorial service and everybody will be a part of it. Everybody will have their own part that they do and it will make it a real family uh, family gathering kind of thing. And you could, I don't think you could or would do that if you were just living on your own. Uh, are there any downsides to having siblings nearby? I can't answer that question without getting into real trouble. <laughs> Uh, you know, sure there are. Uh, family dynamics is, is what it is, but, uh, but they are way overcompensated by the good parts of having a family nearby. Uh, what were your parents' names and what were their careers? My dad was a professor, uh, uh, a scientist, and taught science uh, his entire life um, at Marlboro College. And, uh, and my mom was a folk singer and a folklorist, and she, um, she, when she first started living in this house in the early 1950s, she started uh, doing similar to what you're doing now. She went around to the other people who lived in the town who had been living here longer and asked them questions about, did they know any songs or any stories that there had been passed down to them by their parents and earlier people? So she was collecting songs and stories that were uh, were collected from people who learned them before there were radios even, and before there were record players. So she was kind of trying to capture the oral tradition, as much of it as it still existed in the early 1950s and 60s. So that's what she did. That was her career. Right. Um, what is your partner's name? My partner, my wife Gail. And I have lived here for uh, almost 50 years now, in fact, very close to 50 years. And we are partners in the farming part of what I do here. Uh, so I run, as you guys know, two separate businesses, one of which is uh, doing construction yeah. and carpentry on people's houses, and the other one is the farm. So we'll, f we'll know more about Gail when the time comes to talk about the farm. She's my partner. Yeah. Alright, um, where is she from? She grew up just outside of Chicago. Alright, uh, how did you two meet? We met, we went to, both went to college together uh, for a brief period of time. We met there and uh, she had grown up in a suburb but she really liked the forests and the farm fields around the suburb. She wasn't as interested in the, the suburbia part of it as she was in the, the, you know, the natural aspect. Yeah. So when she first came to Vermont, it was just like she felt like she had come home, and she really, this is where she should have grown up. Right? She did just fine. Uh, what, career, what career has she been involved with? She started driving the school bus about 45 years ago, and drove the school bus for almost 45 years, and she just retired from doing that just a year, two years ago, I guess now. Yeah. So she was a career bus driver, but also a farmer. Uh, partnered with myself on the farm. Uh, you attended the Marlboro School when you were a child. In what years did you go to MES? I went there from 1955 to 1963. Eight years. Yeah. Uh, who were your teachers then? So, uh, when Marlboro Elementary School was first built, it was actually 1954 was the first year that it opened the new school. Before that, people went to one-room schoolhouses in Marlboro. Uh, so I, was, I wasn't there the first year, but I was there the second year. The teachers were Mrs. Eames, who lived in the White House next door to the school. In fact, she donated the land for the school building to be built. And Mrs. Whitney, who, uh, Alice Whitney, who lived on uh, Higley Hill Road. And her family still lives there. Uh, Candy Simon is her granddaughter. And uh, I don't know if there are any of the Whitney descendants in school right now, but there have been pretty much steadily for, for probably hundreds of years, and there will be more as well. So those were the two teachers when I first started going there. And then they changed by the time I graduated. Uh, Bruce Cole was teaching in the upper grades, and I don't re exactly remember who was teaching in the lower grades, but Bruce Cole was... Uh, started teaching before I left and, and was there for many, many years after that as well. All right. Uh, what are some of the similarities you recognize from your experiences then and the way the school is today? I would say that it has a... Uh, there's kind of an openness about it. 
you know the fact that the teachers are called by their first names yeah. and are considered to be people rather than yeah. you know the authority figure yeah. and, and the kids are the kids it's yeah. it's that's trying to be a little bit more egalitarian about it and uh, you know treat um, adults and kids with respect and yet at the same time expect you know along with that goes the responsibility you know the, yeah. the school today still has I think the um, you know they can get together they can make decisions about what happens in the school but you're responsible for that. You have that. You have that uh, capability, but it's up to you to make it work right as yeah. well. So I would say that's an important aspect of what, the way I feel like it still functions. Yeah. Uh, what are your child's? What are your children's names? We have two children, Jason and Robin, and they both went to Marlboro School, and their kids both now go to Marlboro Elementary School. Yeah. How old are they? Oh. Um, 39 and 42. Yeah. Where, do, no, sorry. where do you live now and where are some of their, where do they live now and where are some of their occupations? Uh, so they also live right in this same little micro community here. Uh, you can see my daughter's house right across the road and my son lives uh, just up the road across the road from where the house that I grew up in. Uh, uh, my son and his wife run a, a, an artisanal hard cider making business, Whetstone, uh, Whetstone Cidery. And uh, they, so they make the cider, uh, they grow some of the apples, but they buy some of the apples, they press the cider, they ferment it, they put it in bottles, they have, you know, it's a, they're actually licensed with the Federal yeah. Bureau of, Lic of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, and so are doing a legitimate business. And uh, and their label has on it, I don't think I have an example of it here, but the label on their bottles is a picture of a guy holding up a jug of cider, I think in each hand, and that picture was taken outside of the house that my parents, that we all grew up in. The, the guy who lived there that they bought it from, the previous owner and person to live there last before them, had been a cider maker. And so this is a picture of him coming out of his barn, which is just right up the hill here, saying, I, look what I just made, these jugs of cider. So they, when, they, when they were trying to find a logo for their cider business, yeah. they chose that picture as the thing that would be sort of the, how to present themselves to the world. So his career is uh, as a cider maker. They're also, they grow food and, um, oh, you know, the regular kind of try to keep yourself alive yeah. here. And our daughter, Robin, is an author, and she has uh, had a couple of books published, and she um, has some more out there which are in the process of being published, and uh, makes her living as a, as a wordsmith. Uh, they also attended to the, to the Marlboro School as children. Uh, who were their teachers during the time there? Uh, well, let's see. That They were there just about the time that Bruce Cole, longtime teacher, was transitioning out. So I think that he had me as in one of his early years and my son Jason in one of his later years. I think by the time Robin got into the grades that he would have been in, uh, it, it was beginning uh, a, a changeover to different people. Michael Edelstein was one of her teachers. John Esau was there for our kids. So they were there, well, a good number of years ago now, but uh, um, those were some of the people they had as their teachers. John Morris, one of their teachers. Right, um, um, David Holtzapfel actually was right. was uh, Robin's, I think his first year teaching in the fifth and sixth grade, Robin was, our daughter Robin was in his room. So those are most of the teachers they had there when they were there. Right, uh, what are your grandchildren's names? We have four grandchildren, Ava, Milo, Owen and Louisa. Oh, it's right there, right? Isn't Alva like the little? Uh, she's the one who lives just yeah, right across the road over here. Yeah. Right. And you know, you might know Juno. Juno, uh, not a relative, yeah. but she lives in the little house right next to yeah. so. right. uh, What are their current ages? Eight. Uh oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> Eight, six, five, and three. 
I think. Uh, what are some of the benefits to you in having your children live nearby? Oh, uh, that's for us. It's huge. We happen to love kids, and so having the grandkids close by is great. There's no, there doesn't have to be traveling. You know, you can see them anytime you want. I hope that we are helpful in that. You know, the benefits to the parents, I think, is that if they need to have someone take care of the kids for a period of time, we would like to be available to do that. So it's sort of like your question about the siblings and the other family members. There's pluses and minuses. Yeah. For us, it's all a plus, um, and we just love having them close by. Uh, where did you go to high school? I went to the Putney School, which is a private school. Uh, uh, in the 1950s, the town of Marlboro had the choice as to how to set up the schooling system that they had. They could either become part of the Brattleboro system and have all the kids go to Brattleboro, or they chose at that point the system we currently still have. It hasn't changed in the last 50, 60 years. Uh, as people graduate from Marlboro Elementary School, we have high school choice, and the town will actually spend uh, taxpayers' money to, uh, to if a if a kid chooses to go to a private school. So uh, I, I don't remember the thought process very well. Somehow my family decided I would be well off if I went to the Putney School, and a large portion of the cost was was uh, paid for by the town of Marlboro. So I went to Putney School, graduated from there. Uh, did you attend to college? Yeah, briefly. Huh. Briefly. Uh, where was it? It was in Wisconsin, and which is where I met my wife partner Gail, and I was there for two years. Uh, did you take? Did, oh, sorry. Did you take a degree there? No. Uh, what did you do in between finishing high school and going up to college? That was it. Just the one summer. I had a job working in the in the fields. Um, actually, my grandfather ran a nursery in Kentucky, and I had a job in his nursery for the summer, weeding tiny cottonwood trees, eight hours a day, 40 hours a week. Yeah. Let's stop for a second. I just want to um, talk to Rosie. I'm um, excited for something. Uh, did David tell you that, um, oh yeah, you got it. Okay, never mind. Yeah, I, I've done this before. All right, yeah. Okay. Uh, Sorry. Uh, over the years, you have had a number of Marlboro Town volunteer, voluntary jobs. Um, what town boards have you served? The first one was as a town lister, and I think that was in that was in the 1970s. I was a lister, uh, which is a tax assessor. Basically, you go around and look at people's houses, and you decide what their value is, and then that's the basis on which they get their property taxes. So I was on that board for, I think, uh, I, I don't remember, I think five or six years, and then became a school board member in the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, and that's pretty much it. I think those are the only volunteer positions I've had. Yeah. Uh, what are some of the reasons why you have volunteered for time jobs? So, uh, well, I happen to believe very strongly that uh, that towns will be what you make of them, and that it's a very crucial thing, critical thing, that people step up to the plate and say, I'll do what needs to get done to keep this town up and running, and to keep its independence. And I, the reason I say that is because, uh, you know, uh, you, you asked that question, and I believe that Marlboro Elementary School is a unique school, and I think it... Uh, it, uh, I think that society could have something to learn from our elementary school, and I think that uh, if it's crucial that there be people in the town with the interest and the ability and the energy to to keep working at the school, running the school as school board members. Uh, otherwise, uh, s small schools melt into oblivion. So that's one of my one of my current. Passions. I'm glad you asked that question because, you know, I think that there are school board members all over the state of Vermont who have ideas about how schools ought to be and, and are willing to put the time and energy in, and I think that that's what makes the schools 
the important thing that they are in the state of Vermont. Yeah. Mm, your longest ten tenor, mm, sorry, tenure, no, no. tenure. Mm -hmm. tenure yeah, has been as a member of the school board. In what year were you first elected to the school board? You know, I don't know the exact year. I'm going to say it was 1978, 1979. I can't remember exactly. And then I was on the school board till about till the early 2000s, uh, and then uh, stepped back. Uh, place was going well. I had uh, no reason to uh, carry on, and I also felt like there's a time for other people to have their say in how the school functions. They should be the people to, uh, you know, to hire and do whatever. Um, but then, uh, about two years ago, um, the state of Vermont passed uh, so-called Act 46, yeah. which uh, was in, you know, the, the point of the Act was to get small schools merged into larger units, taking away the role of a small local school board member. Um, so uh, I offered to be, uh, if the school board, if the town voted to change the number of school board members from three to five, I offered to be one of those uh, newly elected members. Uh, so uh, about two years ago, I got re-elected to the school board after a hiatus of about maybe 10 years in between there. Uh, so I've been on and off of the school board for, what is that, 40 years now, 30, 40 years. Uh, uh, what does the school board do? The school board's responsibility are to, uh, to manage the affairs of the school in a way that is uh, responsible to the voters and the taxpayers of the town of Marlboro. So that includes being, if, if a teacher retires, somebody uh, needs to decide who the new teacher gets to be. The school board's in charge of that process. Uh, if the roof starts to leak, somebody's got to figure out how to keep the roof from leaking. The school board's in charge of that process as well. So there's all the physical plant. There's the buses, the building itself. Um, you want it to be as efficient as possible because you don't want to be wasting the taxpayers' money on oil heat if you can make it more efficient. But you also want it to be, uh, you know, you want, you, you know, you sort of asked the question before, in what ways is Marlboro School similar now to what it was when I was going there? And you do have a hand in that. You can hire the people that you think will will understand that the best and be most, uh, will fit in best with that, be respectful of that. So you've got, you've got a fair amount of say in, um, what, in the way the school looks and feels day to day and year to year. So that's what I guess I think is the important part of that job. All right. Um, what is it about the job that caused you to continue to work on the board? Well, I mentioned Act 46 right yeah. now, and I feel like, um, I actually feel we've been pretty influential in the last year or so. Uh, Marlboro was probably one of the, certainly one of the most proactive schools about merging. Two years ago when the law passed, we immediately uh, opened up a committee to look at this and figure out how to deal with it and to try to uh, figure out a way where Marlboro Elementary School could continue to have its own local school board and still be in charge of the way the school looks, feels, functions rather than just get merged into a larger unit and gradually see that slip away. So right now that's where my energy comes from is uh, I feel like we have been effective and actually the timing of this uh, of your interview is great because Act 46 is being revised this year by the Vermont State Legislature. They met this morning, uh, I think at 8 o'clock this morning, the conference committee between the House and the Senate at the Vermont State Legislature yeah. was going to get together. They've each passed different laws, uh, each tweaking Act 46 a little bit, and today I think is the day they're going to decide which way they're going to go, which of those two tweaks is going to be the one that's going to come out and become law, and by which Marlboro will then have to, with which Marlboro will have to comply in order to uh, continue to look at ways in which Marlboro can con continue to be an independent existing school without merging with other districts. So the timing is perfect. We're sitting here waiting for the phone call to say, here's what they passed. And then we're gonna. We, then we'll know what we're gonna do within the next year. Or so, uh, 
Uh, now you're on the school board again. Uh, why did you choose to run for the school uh, for the job again? Well, you, I guess I guess you heard me say it was um, really Act Forty Six, yeah. which kind of yeah, it's tipped most... me over the edge. Um, you know, th there were three people on the board uh, originally back in, when the law was passed, and it seemed like an absolutely overwhelming thing for three people to have to do all the regular work that a school board does as well as try to deal with Act 46. So that's uh, kind of like, you know, throw your hat back in the ring and say, I got some energy and some time for this now. And, and it's something I'm obviously passionate about, so. Uh, what do you say are some of the ways in which the work of the school board has changed over the course of your time on the board? You know, uh, when I was first elected to the board, the, the school board had a lot more uh, authority isn't quite the right word, but responsibility, I guess I would say. The school board did everything back then. You know, they hired people, they hired, fired people if people were, if the board felt they were ineffective, they had to, you know, interfere with that and say, look, you know, we're terminating your job or whatever. Um, uh, responsible for curriculum, um, you know, and, and I think there's a good reason why that's not so true in this day and age, because school board members aren't educators. Very few of them are professional educators. Um, so, you know, uh, as a school board member, I tried to stay out of curriculum uh, because I don't know anything about it. But I don't think that was always true. I think there are other towns in which uh, school board members would say, well, I don't think you should be teaching you know, let's, let's, you know, to use an example, there are states who say, I don't think you should be teaching evolution in our schools. And those are people in positions of authority, but they're using their authority to, to dictate the curriculum that will be taught in the schools. And so I don't think that's a good thing. So I think now a lot more reliance on professional educators to develop the curriculum, and that's the way, it, and I think that's the way it should be. So, you know, maybe school board members spend a little bit more time just fixing school buses, a little bit less time thinking about what's taught in the schools, yeah. but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what are some of the challenges that small rural schools in Vermont face today? Some of them are financial. Um, it's true that Vermont spends more per pupil than any other state in the, in, the, um, in the United States, and that's a challenge. We're lucky in Marlboro in that the taxpayers uh, continue to support the school, and uh, even though all of these little schools are expensive, but where, can, where does that end up? We can't keep going forever like that, you know? So we have to be responsible and responsive to the fact that property taxes are high as well. So that one of the challenges, how can we continue to you know, provide a great education here and not have it continue to cost more and more every year? So that's a big challenge. A huge challenge is the Act 46 that I've been talking about coming from the state saying that uh, they feel that larger merged districts melding Marlboro with several other schools is going to provide a better and cheaper education. Well, that's a challenge for me because I don't accept either of those premises and I don't think that they're turning out to be true. So the challenge is how do you create a, 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 the best education you possibly can without costing extra money and yet say, and yet we want to do that without having to merge with other districts as well. So that's a challenge. Uh, what do you see in the future for the Walmart School and for the work of its board of directors? Well, you know, they, again, your timing is so perfect yeah. because we are, I think, be going to be lucky. And I think we're, Marlboro is going to be one of the schools in the state that re re retains its independence and does not become part of a larger merged district. And so I think along with that comes the responsibility. You know, we were talking earlier about how Marlboro Elementary, yes, there's freedom associated with it, but there's the responsibility that goes with that freedom. I think the freedom 
if we're lucky enough to be considered an independent school and to continue to be able to manage our own budget uh, here in Marlboro, which most schools in Vermont are not going to continue to do, then along with that comes the responsibility to really get their homework done and make sure that we provide a great education and that we don't cost any more than other schools uh, and that we continue to uh, send the students graduating from Marlboro out into the world uh, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to do their work out there. So that's a challenge I think that future uh, school boards are going to face. And I also think that this whole merge thing isn't going to go away. We may have bought ourselves some time. We may be continue to be an independent school uh, for the next few years. When will the next of these legislations come along? There are states, Hawaii as an example, where the entire state is one school district. And it's a much, much bigger population than Vermont. So we could live in a state where there are school board members only at the state level, uh, or we could live, we're sort of the opposite example of that, a town where a town with six, seven hundred residents and, and 80 kids in our own local school uh, maintain the autonomy to really be uh, involved in the, in the direction of the school. So uh, I see that as a challenge. I don't expect it to go away. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions about your work, life as a builder and woodworker, farmer and musician. All right, uh, let's begin with your work as a builder. Uh, how old were you when you first started working as a carpenter? Uh, Gail and I, as I've mentioned before, uh, dropped out of college and moved here in 1969, and uh, we started immediately working as a carpenter. Uh, I worked for another contractor for, I, I don't, can't remember if it was about a year or so, uh, and then have been on my own ever since that. Since 1970, I've been working on my own as an independent contractor. Uh, how did you learn how to be, sorry, uh, how did you learn to be a builder? Uh, I was lucky. My dad was always very, uh, he was a, you know, wonderful, uh, doer of things. No matter what it was, he could do it, pretty much. And, and uh, so when we were, uh, before uh, I went away to college, he had built a couple of homes that I helped him work on, including the one that Juno lives right over here, lives in right over here. And he was always working on our own house. So, you know, the, the mechanics of it uh, just was something I grew up around. It wasn't, uh, I wasn't learning a lot of the, the mechanics of it. And we were also really lucky in that we had a neighbor who uh, moved here in 1970, wanted to build a studio, and then he wanted to build a house. And uh, he, we got to know him. He hired us to do those things. And uh, I, I hate to say it, we sort of learned on the job with him. But he's still a, a good neighbor and a good friend. And uh, the houses are still there and still functioning well. So um, kind of learning, learning as we went. All right. Uh Mm, sorry. Uh, have you ever worked with other for other builders and? Yeah. yeah, just for a brief period of time, and uh, uh, and I don't remember the years exactly. 1969, early 1970. Yeah. Uh, do you always design the structures you build, or do you also work with somebody else's plan? We have worked with other plans. Uh, in general, we work with the owners to do the design. So um, it's been, I guess, I, I, uh, I hate to say a specialty of ours, but it's just something that seems to have worked well over the years. Um, come to us with some ideas. We'll um, thrash those ideas around with you. And in general, we can come up with a pretty good plan that, that has worked for people. I'd say you know, 95% of the work we've done over the years has been a collaboration between the owner and ourselves. Uh, and then, but we have worked with other designs as well, so. Right, um, uh, sorry. Your business is called MacArthur Constructions. How would you describe your work as work of MacArthur Construction? We do, uh, we'll do everything sort of small scale. You know, we don't do any commercial work, any big buildings, uh, or, and we do very few um, multi-family buildings. Single family homes, barns, garages, additions, things like that. Okay. And we're still doing it. We still have, uh, we have three 
uh, employees who work for us as carpenters, and and my wife, my partner Gail, is an employee of the business as well. She takes care of all the payroll, she does all the books, she does all the tax returns, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a it's a small small business. Yeah, right. Um, sorry. Uh, oh, I had a question. Uh, your road is called MacArthur Road. When did that? <laughs> well, that happened. Um, I, I don't know the exact day, uh, date of it because uh, when my parents first moved here, there was only one house on this road. Yeah. Um, camp Naringa was functioning as a summer camp, um, but there was only one house here, and in fact, nobody had been living in it for any number of years. The house that we were all, all grew up in, you know, there were porcupines living in it. It was kind of a, kind of a wreck. Yeah. So they bought the house, they started uh, fixing it up, and we all moved in there in 1951. Uh, and, and because the road went from Stark Road to Route 9, and at some point, someone must have looked around and said, well, what are we going to call this road? As far as I know, it didn't have a name before that. It was just the road that went by, you know, the old uh, Whitney place here. So, so I can't really answer that question, except that it's been called that as, as far as I can remember, long back, as far back as I can remember. Uh, what sort of jobs have you been engaged in during your time as a builder? Oh boy, we'll do everything. Um, we've done electric, plumbing, roofing, you know, all the regular carpentry, uh, little bits of everything. Not so much pouring concrete. We don't do an awful lot of that, but uh, we've done. Uh, but and we tend now to have um, to have you know professional plumbers and electricians come and do their thing. Uh, so we don't don't tend to do uh, much of that anymore. Mostly just carpentry and and you know tile work. We'll have tile people come and do tile. But we do if it's got wood in it, we'll we'll yeah. we'll work with it. Uh, what would you say MacArthur Construction is known for? Uh, I guess I would say that very same thing we were talking about, working with the owners to get something that uh, everybody's satisfied with and uh, you know, getting to know the people that we're working for um, and, having, and being an integral part of the design and build process rather than just, okay, give me your plans, we'll build the building, out we go kind of thing. So I'd say probably that, you know, but uh, I would like to think that the communication has been good over the years. Um, you please describe a building project that you feel was particularly successful and explain why you're happy with it. Uh, we started specializing in timber framing, um, uh, sort of authentic, um, well, you know, quote unquote authentic yeah. timber framing, similar to the style that the house that I grew up in was is built with uh, uh, timber framing. That house was built in the early 1800s, and they cut down the timbers, they hand hewed them, they brought them to the site, and built the frame around which the rest of the house is uh, structured. And we started doing that in the early 1970s, 1973, 74, 75. So, without describing one particular one. We have built many, many, many houses with timber frames uh, where the community would gather after the frame is ready to stand up, all the chipping is done, all of the, um, the you know, uh, all the mortises are made, all the tenons are made, and the, the community would come, the family would get together, peg all of the timbers together, and stand it up, and then that's the house that the family would live in. For uh, you know, they're all still standing, and they're all, most of them, still lived in by the family that we built them for. So I guess that's a, a describing a, not an individual building, but uh, a, a process that we've been through many, many times, and it's been very satisfying over the years. All right. Um, Please describe the process of designing and then building a typical family home. For example, what are some of the things you have to think about when planning and building a home? One of the uh, one of the first considerations is how big do you need it to be? Yeah. Um, how many kids do you have? How many kids do you propose to have? Uh, how many rooms do you think you need? Um, same thing with kitchen living. Do you cook a lot or do you tend to just cook quickly and uh, and you need more room in your living room than you need in your kitchen. So uh, all of those 
uh, are the sort of the most important things. And then starting in the mid 70s, uh, we started also specializing in, in uh, energy and energy efficiency. So uh, a second consideration for me is, after the size of it, is how are you going to structure it so that it, it faces the sun and captures as much of the sun's energy as it possibly can, and how much insulation can you afford to put in it so that when it does get heated by the sun or whatever else it's heated by, you're not losing that heat back out through it. So um, those are important considerations. All right. Um, so, uh, are there types of jobs that you prefer over others? For example, do you like building entire buildings instead of you know, inside out, or just one or the other? Uh, I have gotten over the years um, so that I don't enjoy uh, doing kitchen cabinets as much as I used to. So that's just a personal preference. Yeah. I no longer have the patience to do them. So um, you know, fortunately we have people on our crew who love to build cabinets, but there are also wonderful cabinet builders around. So that's just one thing um, I don't personally do as much anymore. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, uh, I do kind of like to build the whole building from start to finish, whether it's an addition or, or a new home, um, rather than just build the frame and then move on and let somebody else. Uh, that works fine too, but there's something to be said for the satisfaction of, you know, working with the family to come up with the plan yeah. and then staying on the project until they open the door and walk in. That's very satisfying. Uh, uh, well, that's convenient. What makes for a satisfying building uh, project? Can you just repeat what I just said and yeah. go back to that? Do a, do a uh, same thing, yeah. Yeah, same thing. All right, uh, what are the parts of construction process that you really like? You know, um, over the years, the most satisfying part of it has been working with the people. You know, nailing boards together is satisfying. Um, Getting a house well built and tight is satisfying, but I don't think there's anything for me more satisfying than working with the people. Yeah. And you know, it's and for that reason, it's important that it work. It's important, really important that it work well. And so everybody puts their energy into it, and uh, that's been the best part of it for me. People we've worked with. Are there parts you don't especially like but do because you have to? Uh, well, I'm lucky now because I'm the boss, so yes. no. <laughs> you know, over the years, I've done everything, and I don't ask people on my crew to do stuff that I don't do. So, you know, if we're going to crawl around underneath an old building and jack it up and put new foundation under it, I'm going to do it as well yeah. as them. I'm not just, you know, I'm not going to say to them, you got to do this, and I'm not going to do it. Yeah. But uh, none of us particularly enjoy it, mm -hmm. getting all mucky, and, you know, but it's very satisfying, too, to salvage a building that otherwise was going to fall in. So you do what you got to do, I yeah. guess is what you might say. Yeah. All right, um, how many employees does MacArthur Construction currently have? So um, I am the, the uh, not including myself, because I'm the, the principal, um, we have three carpenter employees and Gail as the uh, bookkeeper, right. four employees. Uh, what are their names? Gail is yeah. my partner wife. Um, my son Jason is, a, is besides running the, the cider business, which is what he does professionally, he also works on my crew uh, four days a week. Benji Cragen has been with us full time for uh, I think almost 15 years now, and his kids have grown up during that time and they're off in college now. Um, and then we have a new uh, employee whose car you might have heard start up earlier on and he drove away because his because you know the day's work is done. Um, Dennis Driscoll and he and his wife just had a little baby. He's about I guess about eight months old now. Mm -hmm. So those are the three carpenters. Um, knowing how to do something such as building a home while also running a business can be two different skill sets. How have you learned to do the business sides on your job? The same way, in some ways, as the construction part. Learn as you go. Um, we started small, um, and uh, we, uh, I'm lucky in that, that Gail has a head for, for numbers and for organization that I don't have. So I can 
I can kind of conceive of the business parts of things, but I wouldn't be able to to manage it if it weren't for Dale and her ability to just you know keep track of all the payroll, all the deductions, all of that kind of stuff. So it's a partnership, and we wouldn't work with with just myself. I promise you that. But we certainly learned it as we went. <coughs> Neither one of us has any kind of you know business education or anything yeah. like that. All right. Um. What are some of the personal skills a person needs to have in order to run a business successfully? Well, let's see. Um, uh, I think as much as anything, <coughs> I should say that it's organization, but I'm not going to say that. I think it's maybe vision. And I don't mean, you know, that you have a great vision for, for how the world is supposed to operate. But I can picture <coughs> tomorrow each of my employees and where they, what I think they should be doing um, and what they're going to need in order to do that. And I think that that's as important as anything. It's just being a, a little a step ahead is a real skill that you, you, know, you, you either learn or you had it um, to begin with. Um, so just kind of, you know, see your typical, who are your typical clients and how do they find you? You know, we worked for somebody many years ago who said, uh, I will never hire anyone who has their name on the side of their truck. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a little bit harsh, but we, but I guess the point is, um, we have never advertised. So it's all word of mouth. Um, and, and they find us, because we're a small crew, we don't need a thousand projects. Uh, so they just find us as it kind of works. And they're mostly people from within the community who uh, who hear about us, and we get together and we talk, and we go from there. All right. Um, would you please describe a typical day of okay. work? Why don't we stop right there? Because this is going to be a long question and an involved answer, and we'll run out of time. Yeah. So you wrap it up like the staff. Did Mark there on your script where you left off, and we'll pick it up somewhere around there. And the uh, if we can be in a different place next time, it's not going to affect. Uh, no. The answers are going to be the same. Yeah. And hopefully, we won't be here in this grubby yeah. shop. We'll find a, a nicer place to right. be if it's sunny. Anyway. Right.